Hey guys, it is great to see you again. Welcome for another edition of Sob Talk Live. We are the internet's only weekly show produced just for guys like us in the Sob community and gals too. I always get reminded of that when I don't get that right. There are a lot of women who love Sobs and we're glad that you're here. Mark is off this week. He's not feeling so great, but uh, I do have an interesting guest to help me fill some time with tonight and we hope in a way that's gonna keep you rocking. And that is Gary Stotler. Gary is a former GM engineer who kind of became, well, you were kind of the informal ambassador for Saab at GM, right, Gary? Well, I, I uh, first off, thanks so much for, for having me on, Lee. I oh, sure. feel like some of your, your previous guests are kind of a tough act to follow here, but we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll do our best. Yeah, I, uh, I, I had the, the, the great fortune to be able to um, you know, work with some of the different folks in, inside GM that were part of Saab and that were working with Saab, some, some of whom were you know, folks that had been with Saab for many, many years, and, and some of whom were, uh, were new, particularly as uh, Saab, you know, moved up to Detroit from, from Georgia. So I, I kind of stuck my foot in the door and, uh, and wouldn't take no for an answer. And, uh, you know, had a chance to really talk to people there about, uh, you know, what the heritage of Saab meant and what was special about it. And, uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Well, from that beautiful 99 right behind you there, I can tell that uh, you've got a, a deep love for Saabs and no wonder you became their kind of informal ambassador. Um, Tell me about uh, what your sense of the Saab experience was at GM. Did they know what to do with this brand? Were they kind of struggling trying to figure things out? Well, you know, a, a lot has been said on this topic, Lee, and a lot of people have a lot of different opinions. Um, I, I do think that, you know, perhaps there was a, it was hard to come up with a, a vision and a long-term plan. I, I credit GM for spending a huge amount of money on Saab and trying a lot of different things. And, you know, frankly, building some cars over the last 20 years that, uh, you know, sold pretty well for Saab and that a lot mm -hmm. of people liked and are still uh, still driving today. So, um, but uh, yeah, it's, a lot could be said. If we, uh, if we get the chance, I'd like to hear some about what your, your role at GM was. You were involved in looking into hydrogen powered cars. So maybe, maybe we can get around to that. Um, a, a little bit later on, but let's uh, let's jump into kind of what we talked about earlier, and that was some of this uh, the reason for our program tonight, and that is some of the innovations uh, that Saab brought about. Uh, you know, it, it, lots of people think that Saab was first on many things, and they were first on a few, but not necessarily always on the leading edge, right? Well, I think that's. That's truly, and you can go back in history, and you know you can find somebody who had four-wheel disc brakes first, and you can even find an airplane company that made cars in the 1930s. Um, but I think you know what what made Saab so special was just that, uh, you know, particularly as the company was was launched and went through the 50s and 60s, they were just so creative, and and so they took things uh, that you know maybe had been tried before, and they put them together in in innovative ways, and and by doing that, they ended up with you know, cars that were just, uh, just very special. And, and, you know, they focused on some key areas, you know, obviously the, the rallying side of things and the performance side of things was very important. The safety side of things was, uh, was huge. And they did a lot of great, um, you know, work there that I think contributed to the whole, uh, the whole industry. Yeah, they sure did. And, uh, let's start there. Let's just jump in and talk a little bit about safety. I found this an ad from 1964, in which Saab was talking about safety and how it's a uh, it's safety shell and the cars almost couldn't be crushed with 20 gauge steel and 95 percent visibility from the driver's seat uh, and many other factors that you know were really kind of surprising to be using in marketing. That's pretty sophisticated engineering discussion to happen in a magazine ad. Yeah, yeah, you're you're right, and it's interesting. You know, you think a little bit about who they thought the the audience for that was, but. I've always felt, and I'm, you know, certainly not unbiased, being an engineer myself, that, that really a target audience for Saab was engineers. It was people who appreciated some of this stuff that was, you know, was not flashy, but made it work under the skin. You know, I have to laugh when I see this ad. Um, I think I mentioned to you, I have a 1964 Saab myself, uh -huh. and that, uh, that dual diagonal braking system that's so, uh, you know, prominently displayed in that ad was a new thing they did for 19. 64. Um, and it was, uh, again, I think it was quite an accomplishment and it's something that's completely common in the industry uh, today. 
Well, Saab safety uh, is something that drew me to these cars. Uh, when my first Saab I bought because uh, it was an 84 900 um, sedan and uh, bought it because it was what I brought my first child home from the hospital in. So I was looking for something safe. And then there's another reason that uh, Saab safety is important to me. Um, let me give you a look. Hey guys, an update for you here on the 1989 Saab turbo convertible that you've watched us convert from an automatic into a five-speed. Clearly a bad day for me, my wife, and the car. We're just fine. Uh, another motorist came across the center line directly at us, some kind of medical issue, I assume. And I tried to steer and get out of the way, but she tagged me just right behind the driver's door, spun us around, and threw us across this ditch. So all the work that uh, you saw us put into this Saab looks like it is headed into the junkyard. A bad day for us, and, but the Saab gave its life, and we're just fine. Yeah, so a little personal personal wow, uh, yeah. testimony for Saab safety. And the, the uh, wrecker driver who towed that car out of the, out of the ditch said, I, I don't know how this car didn't just buckle um, right. from sitting kind of straddling that ditch, but it's because of the way uh, that Saab really engineered and built these things. Right, yeah, no, the, the body structure was always um, a big deal right from that 96 that we were looking at a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. Of course, the, the 99 here, again, has the, the, uh, the moose-proof uh, A-pillars, uh, and the uh, I'm sure you've seen that picture of yeah. the, the one where the truck driver hit the bridge and the car is just hanging from the bridge by the yeah. roof, and, you know, nothing's, nothing's bent. <laughs> well, can you take um, a second and put your mechanical engineer hat on and describe that load path uh, about force impact and redistributing it through the car and where they put those reinforcements? Yeah, well, um, you know, I think one of the things that's obviously become well known at this point and very, very important is, you know, first and foremost, you got to keep the keep the passenger compartment intact, because if you don't do that and, and uh, you know, other vehicles or whatever intrude, then that's going to be a bad situation. Uh, but the other thing that you have to do is you have to keep you have to manage the forces in a crash so that they are not transferred into the occupants too abruptly, right? And so that means you've got to do things like, um, you know, have the front end crumple in a controlled fashion or the rear end. Um, you've got to, uh, like you said, be able to transfer those forces as the front of the car is crushing kind of, you know, up into the roof rails up here uh, and through the doors. The, uh, the 99 was uh, one of the uh, first cars that has these big steel beams running down the middle of the doors to uh, again to keep keep things from getting into the the space there. So it's all about sort of um, you know moving the force around the passenger compartment up through the roof down through the floor. And I think in your convertible you could see that um, you know really well that those forces were were kind of pushed down into the floor of the car where there's some really strong members and and uh, you know that's what keeps the car intact while you as the unfortunate occupant are uh are you know riding out the crash yeah uh, i found this image uh that was really interesting um so this is one of those you've seen the videos and we're going to show a couple in a moment of those uh test crashes this was an uh, off-center impact crash and i think this is a 9-3 um but look how intact that passenger compartment is yeah, yeah, no, and, and again, this is a great example because you can see up there at the top where that, you know, that roof structure started to deflect a little bit and absorb some energy, but but it didn't uh, didn't give way, and so that's exactly how it needs to work. Uh, other interesting feature this picture reminds me of is Saab, I think, was the first ones to use what they called uh, supplemental active head restraint or sob active mm -hmm. head restraint and that mm -hmm. whereas uh you know in the event of a, of a crash that headrest would uh, in a rear rear end crash that headrest would come forward and catch your neck and prevent your head from going back into a whiplash situation so yeah hey and just while we're on the point of convertibles uh i came across a video that uh was pretty interesting in that it described um Saab the, the convertibles as being among some of the safest uh, on the road. Let's take a look at that. And while some of us yearn to drive with the top down on a sunny day, a convertible, due to the lack of a roof, is not as safe as a regular car. Or is it? 
This is the first time the Institute has conducted crash tests on convertibles. And among these 10 mid-size models, the best performers were the Saab 93 and the Volvo C70, both of which earned our top safety pick award for overall crash protection. That means, according to the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, these two convertibles are actually safer in many ways than many vehicles they've tested with fixed roofs. How did these Swedish manufacturers manage that? We have compensated for the absence of the roof by reinforcing the windshield header rail, the A-pillars, and also the door sills are much wider and larger than in a regular sedan. In addition, to be a top pick, the Institute had an extra requirement for convertibles. The Saab 93 convertible has a supplemental restraint system that is designed to anticipate and react to a potential rollover situation. When something like that happens, the pop-up bars in the back come up, and also the pretensures of the safety belts put you back in the seat. And that's another reason why it's very important to always, when driving, use your safety belts. Something to think about on a sunny summer day. I'm Andrew Schmertz. Ah, it makes you feel a little bit more comfortable driving a convertible, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. So I'm going to go off the script right now, Lee, because I want to tell you, uh, Jan Willem Bester, who was in that video, was a, was a good friend of mine. And oh. he was a great example of one of the people in GM who came into Saab. Jan Willem actually was with Cadillac in Europe, and he came to, back to the U.S. to Saab. And he was just so, I mean, he... he ate, slept, and breathed Saab, and he hmm. was so enthusiastic. He had a, a classic 900 five-door uh, that, he, that he had as, as one of his toy cars, um, and he was just so passionate and enthusiastic, and we had, uh, you know, we had a really great relationship. Again, I'm very sad that we lost him far too young, um, but he's a good example of, of the kind of people uh, that worked with and on Saab, you know, right up to the end. Yeah, that's... Uh... I think the safety story behind Saab is really remarkable, and and as I said, it's you know one of the reasons I certainly picked the brand. I think a lot of people stick with it because of that. So let's move ahead and talk about some of the other technical innovations that you really appreciate in what Saab was able to do. Sure. Well, I think you know, going on on some other topics from safety, just for a second here, um, what what was really impressive about Saab was their ability to. Uh, like I said earlier, to, to be innovative, to look at things differently, to put things together differently than than other companies did. And there, there really was, you know, probably not a better example of that than what they did with the turbocharger in the late 70s and how they, uh, um, you know, really changed how turbochargers were looked at and how they how they worked in cars uh, to create something that you could drive every day and you'd get usable power and torque at, you know, sort of normal uh, driving, uh, driving speeds. And, uh, you know, one of my uh, one of my heroes is uh, Pierre Gilbrand, who of course was the the, the Saab powertrain genius and the mm -hmm. guy that had a whole lot to do with uh, the birth of the Saab Turbo. Um, and you know, really, <laughs> that's why I still have this car because ever since the thing came on the market, I've just been, you know, so appreciative of the tremendous engineering work that they did and the result they got out of it. And it wasn't like a turbocharger it was a new invention, um, but they took it and they put their own. You know, special stamp on it, and they made it work really in a way that no one else was uh, was doing. Yeah, I agree. You know, it's there's just something about putting your foot into this uh, accelerator and that whoosh that comes on. It's just it it's a great feeling, um, but it does make the car so much more drivable. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's just it's just you know they they rigged it up so that it provides so much torque in normal driving situations, and it's funny. For a while, I had the 99 Turbo and a 99 EMS at the same time. And the 99 EMS is a great car. Um, you know, don't get me wrong. It loads of fun with that thing. And it, it was just, just a little go-kart. But every time I was accelerating and I put the thing in third gear and I put my foot on the gas, I thought there was something wrong with it because it just wasn't there. There was nothing there <laughs> compared to the turbos. <laughs> Where is it? Yeah. Um, All those horses, yeah, I left them behind. Yeah. Right. right. Um, so. Oh, Cameron is asking here, do you know why the Swedes put so much emphasis on safety? I guess not only Saab, but also Volvo, as we learned in that little video clip. Well, I'll speculate a little bit, which I tend to do. I don't, I don't know, the, I don't know a, a, a firm answer to that. But for one thing, the roads in Sweden were pretty undeveloped, at least, you know, after World War II in the in the 40s and 50s when Saab came into being and, you know, Volvo was turning to uh, a lot more more car making. So they had to deal with conditions that were just, 
you know, pretty bad compared to, frankly, what we had in this country. Um, you know, the other thing was, uh, you know, being a winter uh, country, you know, not only is everything slippery all the time, but you've got moose wandering around in the roads and, you know, every other thing. Of course, I, I'm sure everyone's familiar with Saab's uh, famous moose test for uh, for making sure these A pillars stay in one piece. Um, well, now, and, wait a second. Uh, Let's not assume that that's the case. I mean, okay. there are some folks who are just new coming into Saab. They may not know this story. All right. Well, so obviously in Sweden, they have a lot of moose. And I, I grew up in Maine and, and we had some moose up there, too. Maybe that's why Saabs were popular up there. I don't know. But anyway, Saab devised this test, which was a huge bundle of electrical cables, you know, let's say 18 inches in diameter, you know, six or eight feet long. And they hung it from above on a couple of cables um, and and they would drive the car. It was it would hang, you know, right about windshield height. And they would drive the car into this huge, heavy thing that would only flex a little. Um, and they used that to, to test the integrity and the strength of the forward part of the passenger compartment, but particularly these, these, these A-pillars. And that was the Saab Moose test. And, uh, you know, pretty much up until the end, I know I've seen pictures, I think, of the, the 9.5 being tested with that. Mm -hmm. Well, you said you've owned, uh, I think we may have lost your signal there, Gary. There you are. You're back. Uh, yeah, you said um, uh, that you have owned all of the pre-GM pre -GM models, and um, you've owned just about every Saab out there, uh, except for what? <laughs> I, I have, I, you know, I don't know if I should admit this in polite company. I've never owned a classic 900. <laughs> Strange as that may seem, I've had 90, 96s, 95s, 99s, 9,000s. I even had a 94X a few years ago. But Never not a 900. 900. And, and how come? Is that just because it's so much like the 99 that, yeah, you, what's the difference? Well, I actually, I actually think there's, there's you know, notable differences between the 99 and the 900. They are based on the same platform. The first couple of years, there was a lot of of, of similarity, but the 900 was lengthened and a lot of that had to do with the crash forces we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. um, so it had a little bit different ride. It had a little bit different, um, you know, handling steering characteristics. Perhaps it was a little bit more refined and maybe that was something that always drew me to the 99. It was just very, very tactile. You're driving this yeah. car. It's like you've got your hands on the, on the road surface. Um, so, and, you know, a little bit of it was timing, too. I was actually driving a Saab 99 when I graduated from college and went to work for the Oldsmobile division in Lansing, Michigan. And I think if you showed up there in the parking lot with a Toyota in the early 80s, it probably wouldn't have gone so well. But I found out that there were three engineers at Oldsmobile who drove Saab 99. Is that right? How about <laughs> for that? For what that was worth. So, yeah. Once again, uh, the engineer's appeal. That's great. Now, you've also owned... Um, something that's not quite a sob, sort of almost a sob, and that's this, <laughs> built by w Walter Kern. Tell me more about this. Well, so this is a this is a really cool car, and of course, this picture here was taken after at, long after I had it. But uh, 15 years or more ago, I got a phone call one day from a gentleman about 20 miles from here with this story about, hey, I have this this Saab Quantum Racer that I got from my father. And I was talking to, uh, you know, my friend uh, Dave Hosmer over in Connecticut, and he said, you might be able to help me work on this thing and get it running. And uh, so it turned out uh, that, of course, Walter Kern was a, an MIT engineer who set out to build a sports car. And he had support from at least some of the people in the U.S. Saab organization. They gave him some parts. Uh, he built a prototype uh, race car and a couple, they built a couple of, of really nice looking little, you know, sports, sports cars based on Saab chassis and Saab components. Well, it turns out that one of the, the right hand men of Walter Kern was the guy who did all the metal fabrication. Uh, and his name was Mr. Blank. And I don't really B-L-A-N-K blank. Uh, he, I don't recall his first name, but it turns out that this gentleman who called me was his son. And he had gotten this car when, you know, his father had passed and he was uh, cleaning up his stuff back uh -huh. in, in Massachusetts. And um, it actually turned out that it was a second quantum uh, prototype racer 
And there was some doubt originally as to whether that was what it was, but eventually documentation surfaced. And uh, uh, so anyway, I went over and I, I worked on the car with, with uh, my friend Richard. Uh, his daughter was very interested in the time and my son uh, hit it off you know, with her and we had, had lots of fun with this, this project. And uh, eventually, uh, you know, Richard needed to move on and he, he gave it to me. Uh, and I was very hmm. touched by that. I felt like this is kind of a neat piece of history. And yeah. I had it around for a while and, and got it running. It ran ran real well. And uh, uh, Bruce Welch from Vermont, who's a, a real vintage Saab uh, expert, came down and worked on it, helped get the brakes working. And uh, somewhere I have a picture of Bruce driving down the road. He didn't seem too worried about registrations and insurance, things like that. <laughs> ah, you know, Who cares? Not that important. But anyway, and, and so I felt like it would be great for it to go on you know, back to a, a, a racing enthusiast. And so the person you saw there in the video is uh, Stefan Vapa. And uh, I didn't give it to him. He actually he actually gave me a nice case of, of uh, Delaware's finest craft beer uh, in exchange. So, you know, the transactions around this car through its life have, uh, I think, been appropriate for, for what it was. But well, it appears... History. It appears this car lives on. I found on YouTube, uh, I think this car on the track. Yeah. Well, do you know, I know that do you know who's driving stuff, it now? I think it's still Stefan Vapa down in uh, Virginia. And I, I believe he had it out at, uh, at uh, put in Bay in Ohio for the vintage races this past fall. What was this thing like to drive? Um, well, you were sitting about two inches off the ground with pretty much nothing around you so all that stuff we just talked about safety safety, wise, safety yeah wise, forget it it wasn't there <laughs> it was one step above being on a bicycle yeah it was just you and the motor and the wind <laughs> oh that's great well it's a race car that's what it's for right oh, yeah absolutely. absolutely yeah so oh it's fun to watch this thing yeah, that's a, that's that'd a be a rip kick, wouldn't yeah. it yeah that'd be I a lot of fun to do that with it yeah so i've done a few track days in this bad boy but not uh, that one <laughs> So uh, before we, we uh, wrap things up, I want to touch on something else that you do in the Saab world, and that is uh, you're helping a lot of guys who own the new 9.5s solve a difficult problem with their LED lighting systems, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, so, uh, and again, like, like with a lot of things, I didn't really set out to get in, in, involved in that. I, um, I bought a 2011 Saab 9.4X, and... and uh, everybody may not be familiar with those. I think there were only 400 of them sold in the U S it was, it was pretty much the last gasp, unfortunately, but that was the, uh, the crossover sport utility vehicle. And, um, I, I had the thing and, you know, it was a couple of years old, had 40,000 miles on it, and the taillights stopped working. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're, you know, they have these nice little led strips and it's kind of got this ring of fire that goes around the back end, kind of oh, yeah. cool looking. Um, but, there were no replacement parts available. Uh, and, you know, I found out from folks on Facebook and whatnot that this is a pretty common problem. And so I, I said, well, somebody has got to be able to figure out what goes wrong with these things. And, you know, I'm not an electrical guy. Um, but eventually I figured out how to get them apart and found out that, you know, sure enough, it's a mechanical problem that these things have internally. Mm -hmm. They, uh, they, the parts move around as temperature changes and eventually crack the electrical connectors and, uh, and they stop working. So yeah, that picture right there is a taillight from a, uh, actually a nine, three sport combi. Mm -hmm. um, those also have LEDs in them. And, and, uh, every once in a while, those, um, those go out as well. Um, and, uh, then come to find out, yeah, there's the, uh, the third brake light from a new gen nine five. And it's pretty mm -hmm. much a feature of those cars that that stops working. Uh, so it turned out that <laughs> I was able feature. to work. Yeah, I was able to work in concert uh, with a, a guy by the name of uh, Aaron Glaffenheim, who's the electrical engineer behind all this. I don't want to take credit where it's not due. I'm just the guy that cuts them open and glues the new parts in. Um, but uh, you know, these light bars here that that go on the trunk of the new Gen 9 5, same thing. Those uh, those LEDs in the middle and the end, the original circuit board um, failed and would blow out the leds and so all that uh all that needs to be replaced and you know it's it there are kits to do it available but it's a little bit of a fussy job and i've practiced i think i told you earlier i've i put a serial number on each taillight that i work on and i'm up to like 640 at the 
this point. So, yeah, this is the new Gen 9.5 taillight. They have, again, a, a feature where the center bulb melts the housing of the taillight because it's too hot. And then, then the thing stops working and you can't get an inspection sticker. So luckily we were able to figure out how to get that fixed. Well, that's great because I've, I've heard from many guys that uh, those 9.5 taillight issues are, are the are the unobtainium parts that just nobody is making these days. Yeah, yeah. You don't, you don't want to end up with a broken one because that is very hard to replace and very expensive if you do find one. But luckily, the electrical problems and lighting problems, we can fix. So. That's great. So uh, your website is SaabLED.com. So yep, easy right. to find. Sobled.com. Let me pop that back up there one more time and we'll just show everybody what that looks like. If you are there, this is where you are. So Saab yeah, LED so, repair. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. Anyway. So yeah, fun, fun little project. One of those things, who knows what you're going to get into, right? Well, yeah, you know, the Saab world draws you in, in a mirror, wonder of places. Um, it does. We've got just a couple minutes here. Uh, if anybody has a question they want to ask, the chat's working, so go ahead and pop that up. It'll pop up on the screen. I'm, I'm really fascinated by something else I learned about you off the Saab path, and that is you were at GM working on trying to come up with a hydrogen automobile. So you're using hydrogen to power a, a power cell, an energy cell, right? Yeah, that's, that's right. So a, a, a hydrogen fuel cell is a device that basically combines hydrogen and oxygen back into water, good old H2O, a little, little chemical magic happens there, and produces electricity uh, in the process. And uh, it turns out, I think everybody understands by now that electric electricity is a really great way of, of running a vehicle. Um, but, you know, that, uh, they've come a long, long way in the last few years, uh, you know, still have, uh, you know, some applications for which maybe there's a better solution. And so hydrogen fuel cells potentially are uh, a great way to generate electricity to drive a vehicle where you need to maybe uh, run a heavier vehicle, you need to run a longer range. So they're really, uh, you know, starting to come into their own uh, for potentially, you know, things like heavy truck transport, rail transport, um, you know, industrial equipment, uh, that kind of thing. And, you know, we may eventually see them in passenger cars. There's There's been certainly a lot of work in that area. There are you know, hydrogen fuel cell passenger cars for sale in mm -hmm. California today. Mm -hmm. uh, Honda Clarity, I think it's yep. called the Honda, Honda Clarity. Honda, a Honda Clarity. And I think uh, Toyota was playing with that. Toyota. Yep. Yeah, yep. yeah. Um, so, but it's been fascinating and I worked uh, almost 20 years on that. I, a lot of the work that I did actually was on the hydrogen supply side and the infrastructure and the, uh, the equipment. And I still do some consulting in that area today. How interesting. Uh, somebody's asking here, uh, do you know how many NG95s were made? Uh, I, I want to say that there were probably somewhere around four or 5,000. I, 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 I think there are roughly 3,000 in the U.S., um, so not, not very many. Um, you know, unfortunately, things just got rolling there, and, and then, uh, uh, you know, they weren't able to uh, have the funding available to keep the factory open and keep uh, keep on building them. So uh, it's a pretty un it's pretty unusual to see one. Let's just put it that way. Even yeah. here in the Northeast. <laughs> yeah, there's Jim Hickstein checking in. With, he says over eleven thousand of the new NGs were made uh, okay. worldwide. Right. Um, so Thanks, you, Jim, I. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, Jim would know. He's more of an he? expert in that than I am. He That's would cool. know. He would know. Hey, you've got a couple of resource books you wanted to share with folks. Uh, let's let's pop those up so people can have a look sure. at those. Absolutely. Well, there's two here. There's two here that I like. You know, we started off talking about Saab innovations, and and this is a fun book that that was. Stop waving it around here so you can see. This is actually uh, issued in the 1980s, and so I think that the 9000 was just coming into production when this was, uh, when this was was published, but. Um, you know, just a really good treatise on some of that innovative thinking that I was talking about. And then uh, this book here, I've always enjoyed. It's called The First 40 Years of Saab Cars. And if you, it's out of print, if you can find a copy, uh, I highly recommend it if you're interested in the older Saab because, boy, this has got not quite as much uh, ability to figure out the details as uh, my friend Doug over in Ohio because he really is the, uh, the research department, the history guy. But this book is second best and uh, has just facts and figures about so many things that Saab did uh, from the beginning uh, up, up to the 9,000 era. So, uh, you know, that's where I learned everything I know. 
<laughs> well, hey, just while we were on that, uh, Mason Shea was asking, do you know of anybody who might be uh, a specialist on 99 or 900 transmission rebuilds? Um, well, you know, it's getting harder and harder to find somebody to, mm -hmm. to do that stuff. Um, Tom Donnie might be someone to check with if Tom doesn't do them himself. Mm -hmm. uh, Jerry Danner, uh, although he has closed right. Mile High Automotive, sadly, uh, is still a you know a force in the Saab, the vintage Saab world. I would certainly check with Jerry, and and he might have some advice on that. Um, but it's uh, it's tough. It's hard to come by the parts, and there's some you know specific procedures and expertise there also that are. Hard to find at this point. And I seem to remember um, Ian Kudney from Peterson Automotive in Chicago saying that some of his uh, guys in his shop rebuild those as well. So that might that sure. might be a resource. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, speaking of Tom Donnie, uh, everybody's going to be gathering out there in South Dakota uh, in not too long. Are we going to see you out there? Uh, I plan on it. Absolutely. So again, I have to figure out, well, which car am I going to drive? You know, I drove the 64 two-stroke across the country one time i don't think i'm going to do that again yeah, i don't think i blame you but i do have a nice nine thousand arrow that i think could make the trip that's the road car that's the one to take that's well right. we're going to be talking more about that next week as uh, we focus on the soc 2022 with uh uh, the president of the Saab Club of North America is going to be with us next week here on Saab Talk Live. But, uh, Gary, I'd love to have you back, revisit us, and chat some more about Saab down the road. How you feel about that? Sure. Well, you know, a, a half an hour goes by really fast. There's lots to talk about, so I'm sure we could uh, find some interesting stuff. So thanks so much, Lee. Hey, thank you. Really appreciate it. Thanks, everybody, everybody for watching, and we'll see you next Thursday night here on Saab Talk Live. Mm -hmm.